So a bit of history from uh, the European OTM implementation point of view. Um, if we go back to October 2005 when Oracle bought Glog, then there was probably under 20 implementers in, in OTM implementers within Europe. Um, you know, the, there was success in the projects, but it was through individual endeavours. Uh, there's regular issues when you're deploying to production. You know, this was completely manual. Uh, you get typos typing in the same agent twice into different environments. Um, missing master data, et cetera, those sort of things. And uh, quite often regular issues with provisioning users. So you'd set up one user and then you'd set up their colleague and they'd actually have different currencies or different uh, <coughs> time zones, et cetera, because something had been missed. It was all very manual processes. Um, moving on through uh, 2006 to 2009, steady growth of the install base. Um, and within uh, Mavenware or the predecessors to Mavenware, the, the people involved in Mavenware now, various homegrown tools emerged, different people um, created different things at different times to meet their needs. Some people, you know, it's the Excel sheet with some functions on different sheets to make CSVs. Some people went into you know, creating macros. There's um, uh, some access tools, um, some, uh, some VB, and uh, one of my colleagues built a little Java applet that took a CSV file that OGM gave you from one environment and did a little cleanup and removed things like the insert user and the update users so that you're able to then put it straight into another environment rather than getting error messages and things. Um, it would clean out, if, if you had a save query with line, line feeds, it would clean out line feeds so that you were able to put it into the next environment without errors. Um, and then we moved on to, I built out some PLSQL um, processes, but it was quite clear there was a lack of consistency between the different implementations, different people in different places doing things their own ways. Um, also in that time, we, we encountered performance problems on different contracts and worked closely with, with Oracle development. In order, to, in order to resolve those. So there's things, lessons learned that happened around that in terms of do's and don'ts of, of uh, <clears throat> how to set up data, how not to set up data. And a lot of that got fed back into this performance tuning guide that Oracle issues with the, with the application when you install it on the server. Um, so yeah, the, we didn't have any failed implementations. Everything was successful. But there's this mix of homegrown solutions. So when the person who wrote the uh, the tool or the application moved on to another contract, then there's somebody else tried to pick it up. Maybe they didn't understand all of what it was doing. You know, uh, I was happy in PLSQL, someone else was happy in VB. I didn't understand VB, so I couldn't take over that one, vice versa. Um, <clears throat> so there's a certain amount of risk involved with moving resources around between projects. Um, 2010 onwards, then we got into this stage where Oracle Sales suddenly did an amazing job lots of uh, clients coming on in, in Europe and um, you know, a growing company from a Mavenwire point of view. So we realized at that point we needed to start putting in place best practices within the organization. Um, so we aim to have a consistent approach across all the projects. Um, we also uh, have encountered that some of the clients that are taking on OTM now have come from an in-house software development point of view. So there's uh, strict code management processes there from their in-house development days, which they need to apply to, um, to uh, the OTM implementation, which is something completely novel for OTM implementations. You know, before it's very much the case of you, you had reliable people and you trusted them and they did the job and they put everything in production and they fixed the code in production if necessary and um, everything worked but wasn't following code management methodologies. And, um, we, at the same time, we started to migrate our homegrown solutions onto a common platform, which is uh, Oracle Database with a Tomcat Java layer on top. Um, so it's, uh, um, yeah, going towards enterprise grade. And so the result is now we feel we're in a good place and, and we're continuing the, the process of rolling out our internal processes across our consulting base across Europe. So to move on there to the data management best practices that we've, we've uh, come to, um, one of the key things is just to remove the IT middleman. <clears throat> so quite a lot of the processes on a lot of the clients is, is the business will maybe generate an Excel sheet or some other form. They'll raise a ticket to the IT support team. They'll send the Excel file across, and the IT support team will then do some jiggery-pokery, and we'll load that into OTM. And depending on which IT support team, 
it depends on how they're doing that. It depends on um, whether they're using some uh, Excel macros, whether they've got some sort of scripting piece going on. But to move this to the um, remove the IT middleman, then we basically need this uh, the process to not require any IT knowledge. You know, the, the end user needs to be able to take an Excel sheet and bang, it's an OTM. <clears throat> and on top of that, then there shouldn't be a lot of mouse clicks involved in the process. So, <clears throat> sorry, let me drink. And we need, to, we need the processes to be repeatable. So if you transform the Excel sheet today and you transform the same Excel sheet tomorrow, your results should be the same. Your, your GIDs should be the same, so we don't want to be generating sequence numbers, which would increment. Um, have consistent naming conventions, so we're able to have like your rate offering GID, then you use the rate offering XID and the rate geo XID, for example, and um, carry on that one down so that there's a, some sort of consistency there. Um, validate that the data is correct so that, it, that we're not loading rubbish, we're not waiting for the CSV upload, for example, to fail. Um, so we do pre validation to make sure that everything's okay. And, um, and that, that also includes data formatting issues, foreign key checks against the OTM data. So if you're loading X lanes, you check that the regions or the locations are available. Um, and uh, yeah, just to avoid the this, this same repeated errors. But at the same time, while you've got that repeatable process, the business will come up with new rate structures and will come up with new requirements, new business areas, <coughs> new functionality. So you, there needs to be a way to be able to adjust this so that's not the end, business end user going to be doing that. That's passing it off, back off to the IT teams. But there needs to be a, a, a way for the IT teams to upgrade the, uh, the process. Um, yeah, then we define that the, the end user should be able to um, also be able to extract the, um, the data. So if you're doing a, a change for a rates, Sometimes the user will want to be able to extract the data, make a change, and then upload the new version, as opposed to having some repository with Excel files that are the master of the world. And then, uh, obviously, when you load a new rate, then you need the old one to be expired. Otherwise, you, know, you don't want to result in conflicts where two rates are valid over the same day for the same carrier for the same lane. Um, that would cause a nightmare. Um, <clears throat> so that was data, data management, and now looking at user access management, so I'm going to keep jumping between the two. So at the moment we're talking about the best practices, so I'll talk about user access management, best practices. Um, <clears throat> quite early on, we, OTM's really configurable in the way the user access can be set up. So by user access, I'm talking about um, default screen sets, status filters, um, action morgues, action checks, and all these things that are available on that screen, plus the user roles, the, uh, what's now access control lists, or in the older days was the, um, I can't remember, it's too long since I've worked with 5.5. <laughs> Mark? <laughs> yeah, the bit underneath that, the assigned functions. That was all. I was thinking F, but it wasn't working. Um, yeah, so it, it's the, the range. So what we're talking about here is the actual setup of the access as opposed to the provisioning of the end user. But the, the result is that we want to be able to, every time you activate a user and say, and the business says they should have this role and that role and that role, then they get exactly the same as their neighbor who has those three roles. Um, <clears throat> none of this case where I'm seeing things in US dollars when you're in the middle of Europe, or I'm seeing things in, in a you know, completely wrong time zone, or my business monitor is wrong, or I've got the wrong list of saved queries. Um, so we defined here that, the, that basically you, user access almost always you can define into, function, into functional roles and responsibilities and some sort of geographical or domain segregation in terms of the data that you can, can see. So on the, on the level in the VPD profile side of things or the access control list, that's segregating are you a planner? Are you an invoice handler? Are you a manager? Do you have global visibility? Do you not have global visibility? And then on the VPD context level, then you're taking into account the geographical element. So 
Am I able to see the whole world? Am I able to see Europe? Am I able to see just this one warehouse? Am I able to see, you know, this random region of areas? Um, so those are the two, the two core blocks. And then the user role brings those together. So the user role is the place where those all join together, um, which means that, um, and that's the element that you're actually assigning to the end user. So in order to make sure that user A who has role X and then user B comes along and needs to also have role X and should have exactly the same as user A, in order to make that happen with minimal number of steps, then everything else needs to be assigned to the user role or the level as well. So the preference gets assigned to the user role um, rather than to the end user. So you don't have to provision a role and a preference, you just provision a role. It has everything bundled into it. Yeah. The, the downside of this is the fact that you end up with a lot of roles or what appears to be a lot of roles because of the way the data structure is. In reality, it's not a problem as long as you've got a robust way of being able to generate them and provision them. Um, but it, it, on the face of it, it, it suddenly appears, oh, we've got a lot of roles because you've taken that lo very low, lowest level of detail of the preference and the business monitor into that. You're just stroking, Mark, have you got a question? Me? Yeah. No. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was the best practices. Moving on to the, the options to, to, to achieve these. So with rate maintenance, obviously, and, and any, any data management, you can use the OTM user interfaces. Um, they're great for initial prototyping. They're great for defining what way um, you should configure OTM. But once you start ramping up the volumes and ha handling lots of rates or um, lots of locations, lots of itineraries, and start wanting to migrate those from your development environment to your test environment and then to your production environment, um, then there's a lot of risk involved because you're double typing, triple typing, manual data entry. Um, integration, primarily built to, um, to handle the um, transactional interfaces. Mark has kindly told me that there, there is work on the way to improve some of the um, data loading, the, the, the bulk um, data setup interfaces. Um, but equally, integration requires that there's a data source. So you know, the data's got to come from somewhere if you're going to use integration into OTM. So it's great if you're, you've got SAP or another enterprise solution that is your master of locations or your master of lanes, great, you can integrate that. But if you don't have that, if you're bringing it from human brain, um, then you've still got a problem. And that then leaves this, the CSV file upload or the, or the DBXML load. And if you're using either of those, then there needs to be some way to generate the files. Um, so, you know, how do you support those who's in control? Um, you end up with different people having different versions of Excel sheets on different computers, piles of CSV files around. Um, somebody who's a bit more technical, taking loads of CSV files, making a zip file and putting in some control commands. And for user access management, it's, I won't go through it because it's basically the same um, with the addition that I don't know whether that's changed because I haven't touched the screen for a while, but the edit user access screen used to be only available for admin level. So if you had a client where you'd implemented levels that had meanings to the client and you didn't, you'd completely prevented anyone logging on as admin, then the screen was unusable. So how are we as uh, Maven are implementing these um, best practices? I'll skip over that because it's a bit too salesy. Um, so what we've done is, we, we, the earlier slide said, we've started productizing and building up our, our application suite to use internally. Um, so there's the, the two at the top there in green are the two I'm talking about today. So the, the data loader for the master data, et cetera, and the rates, and the user access manager for the um, area specifically around the um, provisioning of the user access area where, where so the data loader is completely, um, you can load any data into any table in whatever way you want to from a business definition point of view. Whereas the user access manager would take a completely different approach, which is this is the best practice as far as we're concerned, way of setting up OTM user access data. And therefore it sort of really brings you in nicely to that and then simplifies the process of provisioning that. 
and then around the bottom there's there's some other applications that I'm not going to talk about today but that, that we um, are building out uh, the one down the bottom there we've just migrating our own um, support teams onto the uh, deliver tool so when we've got uh, support contracts then because the support con the support people are working on multiple clients then we need a central place for them to have visibility of the uh, of the issues they're, they're attacking um, the data loader so the, what, it, what it achieves is we can support multiple environments so you, you've got the, the different environments development test production maybe another test maybe another five tests um, and different versions potentially 5562 six, three when it comes out. So it can support the different schema versions um, implicitly. And it does that just by taking a look at the OTM database or any other application database and goes, okay, great, I've seen what you are, I'm gonna clone you, and away we go. Um, it's user-friendly error handling. So when you load a, a spreadsheet, it will then do some validation and will we'll tell you what's wrong, as opposed to waiting for some SQL error message. Um, this, there's, you, know, you can implement various validation uh, rules and, and mapping and conversion rules, and it's quite expansive now. Sorry. Well, where can that run? I mean, do you have to have connectivity to the database to be able to run that user friendly error handling tool? Or how does that run? It's. Does it need to have access to the OTM database? Yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a Tomcat Oracle database, server-side application, web browser-based. So, yeah, I'll come on to a demo at the, at the end, but yeah. Um, yeah, we've, ju we've just, uh, the first versions uh, generated the CSV zip file in the, in the format that OTM's expecting it, with the CSV util file to tell it which order to load the, to load the different tables. So, um, the product gave you back a, a zip file, and then you just put that into OGM. And the, the beauty of that is that you don't actually have to have it installed locally on the client site. You know, you, you, we can have a, a central instance and um, generate the CSV files there, pull them off and load them onto the client uh, system. At the moment, we aren't doing that because we haven't set up the processes in order to actually you know, have enterprise data on our servers. You know, I'm sure there's some due diligence and validation will have to go on around that if we're going to go that way. But from an from a architectural point of view, the system supports it. Um, so far, we've always implemented it as on, on the local client sites so that the data is within their data center and you know, within their firewalls, within their security networks, et cetera. Um, so then we don't have any personal responsibility for um, you know, if, if, if somebody attacks the server and tries to gain access to the data. Um, the result is a, it's a very quick and robust process, and, and you can load rates on a daily basis with, without any issue. Um, you can tweak it, so we're using it for the, for the like prototyping rate structures, where you have to run a bulk plan to find out whether you've got it quite right, or whether it's producing the results you expect, and then you can go and alter the mapping, reload the, the business data, comes out in a slightly different format from rate structure, and you can try it again. Um, yeah, and so there's the there's the UI for there's a, there's a UI for the the person who's actually setting up the Excel sheet and, and processing it, and there's also a different part of the UI in the in the server side application for um, being able to actually configure it to, to set up what the mappings are, and and it's built so that I mean we have probably 20 or 30 percent of our consultants have good SQL knowledge, and the others have really good logistics domain knowledge. And an understanding of how to implement OTM and how to set up workflows and how to set up planning parameters, etc. But they don't have SQL specialist skills, so it's been built from the point of view that anybody, any of us can uh, can use it, and that extends to, to client side super users. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be our, our team, but at the moment, which generally is. Um, <coughs> sorry, that was a bit loud. And then it, we've also got a f functionality to be able to extract the data back into an Excel file from OTM, so that we can you can pull it out and then put it, change it, put it back in again. And obviously, being uh, enterprise orientated, it's, it's got the, uh, all the security type of setup and features you expect. We'll be building out single sign-on later in the year. So uh, high level picture of the process. You have Excel files, you have configuration inside the system, and you 
press go and you get OGM CSV files out the far end. And we're now building out the functionality to be able to then press a button and have that loaded straight away to you. At the moment, we don't have any XML interfaces built out. Um, if you're wanting to purely persist them to the database, then yes, it could. Um, where it, it, at the moment, it's built from a from a master data point of view. So it's the it's the rolling out your different geographies during the implementation phase, and then the ongoing maintenance of new tender rounds for rates, etc. Um, If, if you don't need OTM workflow to trigger off, then yes, this can do that. If you need OTM workflow to trigger, then that's something we're looking at in the future to be able to start integrating towards the OTM um, web service calls, et cetera, that will, will then fire off an internal workflow off the back of the data change. So 50-50. Um, where did I get to on that? There was something else I might come back to. Um, so the same slide for the user access manager. Um, so our user access, manager, user access manager supports multiple environments again. One of the key challenges we faced when we, because again, this is, a, this is an evolution step from a PL-SQL tool, tooling we had, where it's procedure calls and SQL statements to put uh, data into database tables and then press go with the PL-SQL and it pump it into OTM. Um, so one of the issues we had there was the fact that if you have two or three change requests on the go, and one's saying I want to touch that action check, and one's wanting to touch this bit, and one's wanting to touch that bit, then there's no clarity um, there around who's doing working on what, um, especially with a client that had two had us and also a different support team from a different contractor, um, and they were wanting both to handle tickets at different times in different speeds, and we would probably get the big one that was going to take a month to do, and they would get the one that took like five minutes. Um, but we'd then say, you know, you can't touch it because we're working on something big. Um, so we've built in locking mechanisms so we can define a feature and say, that, yeah, this feature is touching those objects and therefore I'm, I'm going to lock those out and no one else can use them. And then when you, want, you progress the feature through test phase, you can then unlock it again. Um, and this is probably something we're going to put across to the template configuration in the data loader because we've got the same thing there if you've got multiple people working on the template configurations. Um, <coughs> the same queries, what we, what we found was um, you end up with um, very similar save query for one warehouse in, in the south of Germany, almost identical save query for the one that's in the middle of Germany, but the only difference is the location GID. Then you have a very similar save query for a group of warehouses in a different place, uh, you know, so that maybe is two or three warehouses. And the only difference there is you've got an in clause in the SQL statement rather than the equals. Um, and these are typically like you, I want all orders that are available to ship tomorrow. I want all orders that are available to ship in two days' time. I want all orders that are available to ship in three days' time. So from a SQL point of view, these are almost identical. But from a safe query point of view, they have to be um, different. And then we went for a version upgrade and development added one extra order movement status. So the end result was we needed to add that order movement status and change from an equals that to in two things for 2,000 save queries. So at the time, we pulled those out into an Excel file, started doing find replace and all the rest of the jiggery pokery and you know, ended up being a bit of a nightmare. So what the, what the user access management system's got is, uh, is basically a, a save query template with parameters. And then with each geography, you have a parameter list that they would say, I want to use that save query profile. I want to use that profile of save queries with the different definitions. This is the location that I want to do them for. And then when you press the button, it pumps that into OGM and you get all the save queries with the, with the location in. And then it, br it brings in the uniform naming conventions as well. So you basically define like the user role is a string of different bits. So there's a piece that defines what the functional role is, whether a planner, an invoice handler, et cetera. There's a piece that defines what the geography is. There's a piece that defines what uh, currency they're working in because quite often you'll have somebody sat in an office in one place who needs to work in um, 
US dollars and in euros and maybe in uh, British pounds. Um, <coughs> so therefore, you can, you could, if you implement the preference on the user level, you've got, that person's got to log out and then log back in. If you implement it on the role level, as we do, then they can just go to the, the button at the top of the screen and say change role, and then their screens have changed from US dollars to euros, for example. So for the invoice handlers, that becomes quite critical functionality. Um, and also from a provisioning point of view, when you're creating a user, it's very easy for the business to say, I want planner in Germany South Warehouse because they know what the string means as well and what the different bits of code. I mean, you're restricted to 50 characters and to be honest, any more than about 30 looks a bit of a pain on the screen, but it still ha has meaning behind there or at least you can have a crib sheet to say this code is that meaning. Um, creating action checks is also greatly reduced. I'll, sh I'll show a screenshot of that. Um, actually, I might not because it's on the other laptop. But if you come to the booth, there's a screenshot of a, of a action check screen where we've basically summarized everything onto one place. So you can define the same query, you can put labels in, um, the labeled text in, rather than having to go off and create labels. And you don't have to then assign it to lots of different places. You just, you know, it, it's there. There's, it will generate the same query, the same permission, everything from the one screen. Um, and again, the same as a data loader, you can load to OTM or via the CSV to upload. Um, so the process, I've basically already shown you that on the previous slide, and then this is the log-on screen. So yeah, this is this is the uh, PowerPoint where. <coughs> but if we drop out of this, then this is the real thing. And because the internet connectivity is so slow, this is running on my laptop, so it's, it's reasonably lightweight. Okay, so it's not extremely fancy. We, we, because we're OTM consultants, we built it in the image of OTM because people using it then are already familiar with the OTM way of screens. Um, <coughs> it's, it's evolved a little bit since then, excuse the pun, um, but uh, pretty much the same. So there's, there's, we've got an administration scene, screen for the sysadmin where you've got the, the usual stuff. So, you know, We've got security inside the system for what people can do, what things, what screens they can see. So that's there. Down here, we've got um, concepts of an application. So in this case, OGM is an application. Um, concept of a track, some people will call this environment. Track was a phrase we coined on a previous client where they had uh, OTM and SAP and the middleware and some warehouse management systems. And that was then termed as a track because the, they were all in connect connected to each other. Um, Client I've just been on now, a track is a development stream. So then, if <laughs> this label's a bit meaningless, then you could go and change the label. Um, and then underneath the, the track, then there's a, there's a definition of a schema. So here we've got glog owner, and we're saying it belongs to it's on an OTM DB server. Um, and then here we've got a uh, record which tells it tells the system where to connect. So, I mean, this, this isn't connected to OGM at the moment, so, but you can put in the service name, the SID. We need to upgrade it to handle LDAP connectivity. Um, so, and then, and then the, <coughs> the server URL is there from a forward thinking point of view, this same screen, this administration page is, is common across all, all our applications. So, um, so the server URL there is to, uh, for when we're connecting to application and web tier servers rather than to day space. Um, <clears throat> one of the key things that drives the whole system is this uh, foreign key dependencies table, which may be empty on this environment. No, it's got some stuff in it. So this is just telling the, the system when it's generating the CSV file, obviously it needs to know um, which order the, the, chip, the, the table should be processed in. So this is just giving the system the, the necessary information so it can put things in the right order. And if we move over to the data loader, the, the view the end user gets, um, the button to click choose, they can select an Excel file. I'll open it in a moment. And that's now loaded into the system. Um, there's a few more mouse clicks than we'd like here. We're, we're looking at simplifying it down to make it just even more streamlined. You can click import file. Uh, it can handle multiple sheets inside one workbook. So you get the choice to select which sheets you want to process. Um, and if I actually click the button, that's now imported. So now it's in the database. 
Um, and then now you get some more actions. So you process the Excel file. Uh, again, uh, you select the track because the tracks could be different OTM versions. They could be different applications. So that's why you select a track in order to, first of all, it might be a different schema. And secondly, it, it might have different data. You, some clients have different locations in different environments, and therefore you're validating against different things. And then you click Continue, and off it goes. There's some progress bars, some funky stuff going on with parallel processing. Um, it's going a bit too quick, but it's just done some validation. Now it's doing some mapping. Um, and then it'll get to a point, and then it'll work out how many CSV files it needs to do, so it jumps back a bit and starts building CSV files. <laughs> that's the reason you can see it is because I had my system on normal rather than high performance um, and then you, the dashboard changes again and so now you get a, a action there to, to download the files and here you get given a zip which you can save to your hard drive and then upload into the OTM UI so for anybody who's worked with CSV zips with OTM then that'll be quite a common view the CSV data and the CSV util file which tells OTM which order to process the files and that we're using UTF-8 encoding. Um, <coughs> this one was uh, on, the, if I go and open an Excel sheet, um, this, this first screen is just cleaned down so that you only see your own files. If you want to see other people, what other people have been loading, then there's a, another files tab. And then the Excel template here, you can download Excel templates. Um, so I've been using this demo rates Excel uh, TL one and you can download it in the, the new XLS X format, which allows you to have more than 64,000 rows. I'm probably overrunning by a long way. Um, <clears throat> so when you download the template, it looks like this, and the, the difference with the one I uploaded was it looked exactly the same, but had some data in it. Um, and then up here, I haven't got a default set, but here you've got a processing type. So you can tell it you want to insert or you want to expire if you're doing rates. You want to delete something, you want to correct something, so insert update, or you want to version. And the version is basically insert plus do a second iteration and work out what you need to expire. So, so Neil, this is the template for the file that you originally uploaded? Yeah, so this, this is what the one I literally just pulled off the server. And if I go to this folder here and open this one, it looks very similar, but has some data. And that's the file you uploaded and then converted? Yes. And the final piece, and then I'll let you all go to lunch, is if we come back to the My Files and I upload another file, Here's one I made earlier with the TL2. Open, same thing. I'll just go quickly through this because I've shown you already how this bit works. It's processed. We go back. And this is the piece we do want to get through with some mouse clicks. So now when I process the Excel file, I have to select my track again. Continue. It's running. It's doing some validation. Oh, it's gone yellow. We've got problems. And so then when you click back and go back to the data load, it's saying there's errors during validation. And when you've viewed validation errors, you get the file back, and the screen is a bit smaller than I expected. But over here, there's an orange box. And if I hover over it, it's got a comment to say the cell must be filled in, because it was a mandatory field. So it it's, can do mandatory. It can check with whether the OTM foreign key is there. It can check whether it's a certain, certain pieces of text in there, whether it's the numeric text date field. Um, and when you've got multiple thousand rows, then it's got a, um, automatically has this filter here, so you can um, work out how to use Excel. You can select the errors, and then you straight to the errorless rows, so you can work out what you've done wrong and correct them. Any questions? In fact, actually, if I open this again. Uh, we have identified some other uses. So loading to loading performance test data, for example, hundreds of thousands of rows. So, yeah. Yeah. So in, in the background for the configuration, it might be worth taking this at the, at the desk for anybody who's interested rather than holding everyone. Um, there's a, there's a, what's called an, what we call an Excel template. And here, if I open the, the TL rate uh, one, then 
here there's some information telling it which cache it should use for checking the uh, checking the validation and versioning and then down here excuse the label error that's a deployment issue on I deployed this this morning in order to cope without the uh, internet um, so here you're basically telling it which column in the Excel file and, and then if we open this one you're telling it that it's a type string this it's a carrier ID from internal point of view in the mapping uh, but there's a field here if you don't want to have carrier underscore ID for the end user you know you can type in something more pretty in lowercase and with some spaces um, here for the for the end user to actually see and then that would be what's in the Excel sheet not not carrier underscore ID um, there's various validation pieces here so this is saying it's mandatory etc and all the other types of validation we support there's a piece here to do a cleaning so if you've got common errors like they use a hyphen instead of an underscore and underscore instead of a hyphen it can automatically swap those for you it can trim off spaces and things if there's common uh, typo mistakes that end users make um, and then if we go cancel that one there's advanced validation I won't go into that now but it just allows even more complex validation that the other screen can't support um, and then there's a, a mapping what we call mapping nodes and this is akin to table but there's cases where you want to load like two different ref nums or you want to load uh, truck load rates and vessel rates so node is basically a table a mapping for a particular table but you can have multiple nodes for the same table uh, so here if I open the accessorial cost one um, on these you define what the input columns are uh, this is an old template before we before we which has been around for a long time before we've made significant upgrades to the system so here you've got a list of all the columns from the Excel sheet you want to use um, now then in general if you're using these ones already I say on the rate offering then over here you instead you select that I want all the columns from the rate offering node thank you very much and it'll pull those across so then if you go and add one more table to the rate offering you don't have to go and do it on all the nodes um, so there's various things as we've learned that there was things that were time consuming we've simplified and improved the process over the last two years and then there's what we could call output columns um, and then this is an expression syntax purely proprietary that we've I've defined um, and the result is that there's a help file which has them listed out probably needs a bit of tidying up but it's that there is reference data there to explain um, <clears throat> this one here for example at T is saying use text so th they all have a hyphen behind so this one's saying I want a in that column this one here is a little bit different at C so I want a column so it's taking price from your input Excel sheet and putting that in that field um, S use an Oracle function NVL um, and then if it if you know, use currency unless it's null because of the NVL otherwise use text USD uh, up here then we've got um, a, a much longer string however it's just built up from blocks dollar separates as a concatenation so it's just really small blocks um, so it's quite easy to read once you're used to it at T dash TL dash so it's going to be text TL dash followed by the column carrier scack followed by a dash which looks a bit bad but at t dash dash is actually a dash um, at c accessorial so we're taking the accessorial field from the input sheet um, and then we're adding on 20 because we, we've defined in this one the input sheet only has um, two uh, has yy it doesn't have uh, the full string so we're adding 20 for 2012 for example and then it's doing a character conversion of the column effective date in year month day so it, it looks bad but actually it's very simple and then we come on to the GID and the O says use an other so this is saying use the value of the main name which is uh, down here so use this one because I've predefined it I don't want to bother typing at T demo again um, then use a dot and then use the value of the accessorial code XID cost text ID sorry so again if you then want to change the way the cost text ID is defined it will automatically cascade to here and then you can cascade off to a different table so rate offering X ID cascades to rate offering GID cascades to rate offering GID on the rate record cascades to all the way down um, so it, it, it ends up being really powerful and all that's happening in the background is this has been converted to some wacky great big SQL statement did that answer your question yeah, yeah sorry I've now everyone's late for lunch <laughs> All right, thank you.